Cobb TV. Watch your life make sense. Welcome to Kabbalah Revealed. I'm Tony Koznak. I'm a student, one of the students, of Rav Michael Leitman, who is the direct disciple of Rav Baruch Shalom Halevi Ashlag, who is the son and direct disciple of Rav Yehuda Ashlag, Bala Salam, better known as the master of the latter, who was acknowledged as the preeminent Kabbalist of the 20th century. I give you those uh, credentials because there is such a thing as a teaching lineage within Kabbalah and what we are going to speak about is authentic Kabbalah and we're going to give you a perspective uh, not of uh, scholars uh, but of practitioners people who are Kabbalists and in this series you'll get not only an overview of authentic Kabbalah but also the keys, the basic concepts uh, the ways of approaching this wisdom so that it can open to you because it is a, a way of study a way of thinking and a way of feeling very different from our normal sense of things and it requires as any skill does um, uh, a mastery of the of the basics and in our series of uh, 20 or so lessons we will cover all of the ones that are important for you to know but let's start with uh, an overview of Kabbalah because there's a great deal of confusion about it. There's uh, a lot of information about Kabbalah out there. There are, I think, maybe a thousand books a year are published on the subject. And almost none of them have anything to do at all with Kabbalah. They're just some kind of a mishmash of people's imaginations of uh, what they think it could be, what it should be, their intuition, their imagination. And it's not their fault. There's a great longing to know what Kabbalah actually is because there is a sensation that it's important, that it's powerful, and that it has a grasp of something that uh, is hidden in this world. It's called a hidden science for three reasons. One, it has been purposely hidden by the practitioners of Kabbalah themselves, by the Kabbalists. Kabbalah started 4,000 years ago with Abraham around the year 1947, 1948, before the Common Era. And for that period of time, 2,000 years until the beginning of the Common Era, the destruction of the, uh, of the Second Temple, uh, it was not hidden. It was, uh, it was widely taught. You know the stories of, uh, of Abraham sitting in the door of his tent and welcoming travelers to come and, uh, and, and he would show his hospitality. Well, what he was actually doing was he was feeding them and he was teaching them about the wisdom of Kabbalah. And the type of souls that lived at that time in this world uh, were a little bit more refined than, than the souls that live now, and they understood it more naturally. But something occurred at the beginning of the Common Era, at the destruction of the Temple, that made it impossible for people of that generation and for the 2,000 years that followed to really understand anything in Kabbalah. 
That's the point at which religions appeared. That's the point at which speculation about how this world works, what the universe is, what the creator is, and so on, grew up in the imaginations of people according to a particular principle that, that leapt to the forefront within the human being in, in their development. And this quality within people prevented them from understanding. And so the Kabbalists hid it. So if you don't have access to something, you still have the books. The problem is that it's also called a hidden wisdom because the books themselves are written in a very special language, unbeknownst to the people who are reading them. All the books of Kabbalah are written uh, in a language called language of branches, in which they use words from our um, world, objects, cup, book, table, uh, family, uh, travels, wars, all of these things that you see in the, in the five books of Moses and all the other Kabbalistic books, but they're not speaking of anything in this world. Not a single word of any Kabbalistic book is referring to anything in this world. It only refers to the forces above which create and sustain the things that appear in this world. And so the Kabbalists used a, a special language that would indicate that uh, what they were really speaking about. And only uh, a student who had attained a certain wisdom would be able to understand and hear it that way. Now, you have to understand that the world that we live in is not a world of causes. It's a world of outcomes. There is nothing that we do in this world that uh, has any effect whatsoever on the upper world where, uh, where our source comes from, where the things that we see in this world take their roots. No physical action has any effect on it. And that's why any of the things that we do in order to solve our problems here in this world uh, have any effect whatsoever on their outcome. Only a connection to the roots, to the causal level of things, can have any effect whatsoever. And this is what Kabbalah deals with. Our reality as a whole is structured in such a way that there is a world that exists above, so to speak, and a world that exists below. And the language of branches points to what exists in the world below. It speaks about this object, let's say, a family. You, you read about it in the Torah, and the Torah appears to be the story of the Jewish people. Well, a family will move to a location called a land, but the Kabbalists are not speaking about this at all. They're speaking about the abstract forces above that actually create these things and make them occur. And uh, only a wise student can understand what's really going on here. This is the branch level, and this is the root level. So unless a person learns how to read and understand the key to this language called language of branches, they will continue to see things as they exist in this world. So as a result of those two aspects of uh, hiddenness of Kabbalah, and because of a lack of contact with the teaching lineage uh, and the real methodology, people have uh, still needed to know. But they've had to fantasize. They've had to make concoctions of things. And they've gone according to what they could understand without a correct teaching and without the proper inner properties that would allow them to understand it. And so a lot of myths have grown up. Now we will deal with these in a little more detail when we talk about some of the other uh, basic concepts of Kabbalah, but uh, just a couple of the major ones are that, um, that Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. Well, it is neither a religion nor is it mysticism. Kabbalah predates religion. Religion is a phenomenon of disconnection from the upper force, of speculation and a misunderstanding of Kabbalah, even though it has a formal similarity with it. Because the Kabbalists created halacha, they created the books that, that we study and consider to be holy books, uh, and uh, our traditions and so on come from them. But the purpose, the meaning of them, uh, what the books are, write, are, are actually written for and what they speak about, we are not very well in touch with these things. So the relationship with Judaism is like uh, Kabbalah and amnesia.
Now, as far as mysticism goes, uh, Kabbalah is a science. It is not a mysticism. It's a way of, of making a direct connection with things that uh, seem to us uh, magical and unfathomable only because we, in our current state of awareness, don't understand how they work. And it's the same as if you brought a lighter to uh, to some tribe that lived in, in, uh, on a desert island that had never seen any technology at all, you would be the god of fire. Some mystical creature that can produce fire out of your hand. I mean, it's simply a matter of what is hidden and what is revealed. Um, that, uh, that it's magic. Uh, well, magic implies the using of, uh, of hidden upper forces in order to manipulate people to get what you want and to cause certain outcomes for your benefit or against other people and so on. But it's impossible to m make any contact with the upper forces at all unless a person changes their moral inner nature. The attainment uh, within Kabbalah uh, is a matter of inner transformation and it is impossible to be in contact with the forces without that. So this has simply has nothing to do with anything except somebody's uh, vivid imagination. Um, that only a few people uh, are allowed to study uh, Kabbalah, and there are conditions. The conditions being you have to be Jewish. This is not so, because the Kabbalists all along taught people who were not Jewish by birth. Some of the greatest Kabbalists, in fact, were um, uh, uh, Gentiles, people of other nations. Onkelos, um, Rabbi Akiva. The list goes on, and, they had, and all Kabbalists took students who were worthy students, but not based on some kind of physical attribute, but on an inner attribute that is called uh, Yehud or Yehud. And we'll explain that later. Uh, that uh, you have to have a lot of, you have to have mastered preliminary wisdom, Gemara, uh, uh, Mishnah, and so on, before you can, you can uh, study Kabbalah well. If you don't understand what's written in, in Torah or, uh, or Gemara, or, then uh, you're not going to understand Kabbalah either. So um, it's not that you need these preliminary wisdoms, it's that if you cannot find spirituality in these preliminary wisdoms, you must move to books that talk directly about spirituality in a way that they can't be mistaken for things of this world, like the language in which the Torah is written, or the language of stories, Agata, and so on. And uh, amulets and protection and uh, the, the use of, uh, of number and letter manipulations in order to, to create stuff and to uh, protect people from evil. Well, this is the complete and total opposite of what Kabbalah deals with. In fact, it's completely forbidden. It's, it's considered idolatry that one should use the upper forces for some selfish personal reason here. And besides that, there is nothing to be protected from. So holy water, amulets, red strings, and so on are, are psychological things, and uh, they have absolutely nothing to do with Kabbalah. And finally, there's the mixture of Kabbalah with uh, uh, Eastern religions, where since we didn't know anything, we uh, made an association with Buddhism or with uh, aspects of Hinduism that deal openly with, uh, with spirituality, and that's only because spirituality from the, the books of, um, of the Kabbalists were not open. However, that's changed. Uh, as of 1995, all books of the, of the Kabbalah were open. The only requirement for Kabbalah uh, to be accepted as a student and to feel and <laughs> that you should feel safe and, and comfortable in looking at, uh, at Kabbalah and seeking the thing that you need, the only requirement for becoming a student of Kabbalah is that you have a need for it. That your answers uh, as to why uh, things happen and to the meaning of your life and your role in it. If these things cannot be answered anywhere else, that's the requirement. Uh, and all the great Kabbalists have said so. From the time of the Aryan, uh, he said the only requirement was this desire. Rav Kook, who was himself a great Kabbalist and even uh, the, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, when he was asked who can study Kabbalah, he said everyone. So it's not so. And finally, my favorite is uh, that if you study Kabbalah, you'll go mad. It's my favorite because uh, it's like everything else, it's just the way that things appear. The kinds of interchanges that a person goes through 
uh, as a result of, uh, of attainment in Kabbalah, of the understanding and connection uh, with reality. The pleasure that they get, the source of the pleasure that they get is very different from uh, a normal way of, uh, of thinking. It's opposite because it is the kind of thought that exists in the spiritual world. So to somebody who has, a, who has a, an opposite goal from spirituality, a person may appear insane. But not really. So the third reason that uh, the Kabbalah is called a hidden science is because it deals with what is hidden from our five senses. It answers a question that can't be answered any other way. It answers basically what is the meaning of life. And this is a deep and a severe question because for a person who has this question, who cannot find the answer in what their traditions tell them, in what their science tells them, in what art and literature tells them, in what psychology tells them, a person who simply cannot be satisfied with anything but the answer to this question, what is the meaning of my life? This is a person who is ready to sense beyond the five senses. The books of Kabbalah tell us that we live in the whole of reality. There is a totality of reality, and that's where we actually exist, except that we have no sense of that. We have a completely restricted sense of what we are and where we are, so much so that we don't know what will happen in the next moment of our lives. We do not know why things happen, when they happen, where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. There exists a complete and total reality. And this reality is divided and reduced into a system called worlds. By means of five worlds, the complete reality, an unending light, becomes reduced to a brightness by which we can perceive. This first world is called the world of Adam Kadmon. The next world is Atzilut. The next is Beria. Then the world of Yetzira. Then Asiya. You can think of these as levels of consciousness. Closeness or distance as it descends from this complete reality, from connection and awareness to it. Until finally we reach a disconnecting point called Mahsom or the barrier. These are spiritual worlds, and below this barrier is our world. Here, we have absolutely no sensation of the spiritual worlds, of the place that we actually live and where we came from. Here, we have limited sensations that are called corporal or physical. This complete light and whole of reality by which if we knew this and was connected with it, we would be able to direct our destiny. We would stop making mistakes. We would understand the forces that, that guide us. We would become connected with them to such a degree that we would be able to live life in its fullest and for the benefit of all life. And yet, just as Kabbalah itself has been hidden from us, so has this force, this complete reality, been purposely hidden from us, reduced through these levels, 
by a system of 125 steps into this world. What Kabbalah is meant for is to allow a person to trace their steps from descent into this world back through 125 steps all the way to our root in the spiritual world, our source and connection with the total of reality. But in order for us to be able to achieve that, this benevolent force, which we call the Creator, has purposely created a system for us. In other words, this map of creation is not the end of creation, it's the halfway point. It's a process by which we descended from our roots in the spiritual world to the state that we're in now in order to fulfill the plan of the creation itself, in order to rejoin this total of reality. All of the books of Kabbalah, including our Torah, Mishnah and Gemara, speak only about the states that are found at these levels, both of the reduction as our soul fell from this complete connection, and of the states that we find on the ascent back up. And the method of Kabbalah is the means by which a person can begin to sense and enter the spiritual world. Now, in order to do that, a person needs to be taught uh, what, they're, what they are made of, what it is that prevents them from the entry into this world, and how they can gain a sense of the spiritual again. And this takes a very special, um, very special material, very directly created for the purpose of allowing a person to enter the spiritual world. So the books of Kabbalah are written in the language of branches and they're very difficult for us to understand. It's no wonder that we have great difficulty being able to use them on the surface level to learn anything about how we can enter this higher reality. But the great gift of Kabbalah is that in our generation, since 1995, when the wisdom was opened to the world as a whole and to those who really need it, uh, special books have been prepared for us. These books were written, uh, commentaries written by Bala Salam and by uh, Rabash, his, uh, his son and his disciple, that for the first time were not written for people, Kabbalists already in the spiritual world. They were written for people who wish to enter the spiritual world. They're written in a special language that allows a person to get a foothold on the first rung of the ladder. And it's from these books uh, in the lessons to come that we are going to take uh, our sources. We are going to look at uh, what the quality is that keeps us out of the spiritual world, what it is that allows us to enter the spiritual world, and the method revealed in the science of Kabbalah through the works of Bala Salam. The wisdom of Kabbalah teaches a practical method of attaining the upper world and the source of our existence. By realizing our true purpose in life, man attains perfection, tranquility, unbounded enjoyment, and the ability to transcend the limits of time and space while still living in this world. Join us next week as we begin this exciting journey.